Here in the last few years, synth prices have gotten out of control. We started seeing $2,700 Poly Brutes, and then $3,600 Profit Fives, and then $6,000 Moog Ones. It seems like our favorite synth manufacturers are in a space race to release increasingly bigger and badder instruments, these absolute beasts. And now with chip shortages and global supply chain issues, we're starting to see some synth prices increased further, in some cases even for older models that have been out for years. The prospect of an affordable, polyphonic analog seemed more and more unlikely. Enter Dreadbox. In defiance of the trend, Dreadbox have decided to release a synthesizer that boasts affordability as one of its main draws. Are six creamy, real analog voices for $600 too good to be true? Today, we'll find out. I'm Donald Jordan for Bloom Music, and this is the Dreadbox Nymphs. The Nymphs is a true polyphonic analog synthesizer that is priced to be affordable for pretty much any musician. And while various allusions to mythology convey a sense of something mystical, Reality begs the question, what sacrifices did Dreadbox have to make to reach this unreal price point? To begin to answer that question, let's look at the synth's architecture. The Dreadbox Nymphs is a six-voice analog synthesizer in a remarkably small package. There is a single oscillator per voice with a continuously variable shape a square wave sub oscillator and noise source are also available in a small mixer section. The filter is a self-resonant 24 decibel per octave unit complemented by a non-resonant 6 decibel per octave high pass filter. There are two ADSR envelopes on board, one dedicated to the filter and the other to the amp. There are two LFOs, one monophonic and one polyphonic both with delay and fade controls. You get a single effect, a reverb, accessed from a dedicated menu control section, which also includes an interesting quasi-modulation matrix. Now let's take a deep dive into these individual components of the NIPS. The VCO has an exciting tone and texture, as we've come to expect from Dreadbox, and the voices sound appropriately alive, stacking up nicely. There's an instability to the timbre and pitch that gives them life. This is an initialized patch with zero modulation. The pitch dances frantically within about a two cent range and it's absolutely delightful if that's the kind of thing you're into. Consider yourself warned if you're looking for DCO style rock solid pitch. Like the Nymphs of Legend, this oscillator is playful if not a little mischievous. The oscillator has a continuously variable shape from saw to square, to triangle, and everything in between. Simultaneously, pulse width is available for the square wave, so that opens up a wide range of timbres. I love blending a bit of PWM square with a saw wave. It's a great, rich sound. A 
little three fader mixer section lets you adjust the levels of your main wave, a nice square wave sub oscillator for when you want to fatten up the bottom end, and a noise source. For the oscillator section's final trick, there's a detune control that provides tuning spread between the voices. This works in all play modes, so you can use it for fat unison stacks, or to thicken up your polyphony. I do wish there was a bigger sweet spot at the beginning of the fader throw. It goes from thick to broken a little too fast, but you can dial in the perfect amount with a little finesse. The 24 decibel filter in the Nymphs sounds great with just the right amount of roundness and smudge for a polysynth. The resonance will self-oscillate, but there is a nice useful range in the first half of the fader throw where you can get some beautiful resonance tones without eating up the rest of your patch. You also don't completely lose your bass as soon as you introduce any resonance as with some other 24 decibel per octave units. It's not until you push the resonance into the 80% mark that your sound really starts to fade into the background and the resonance takes over, and even then it's still completely usable. This particular patch is stupid simple. Just some amp release, about 50% filter tracking, and about 75% resonance. No tricks, just great sounding oscillators and filters. Beautiful. Also included is a 6 decibel per octave high pass filter for when you need to clean up some bottom end. There's no bass bump at the lowest setting and no resonance, it's just a straightforward high pass. But being a polysynth, it's nice to see the inclusion. Considering the obvious influences of this synth, a single envelope or LFO might have been expected, but Dreadbox generously gives us two of each. The two envelopes share a set of four faders. If plucks are your thing, these envelopes will get you there with a great snappy decay. long end, you have attack, decay, and release times of about 25 leisurely seconds, so plenty long for those who are interested in more evolving sounds. The Nymphs LFOs are particularly interesting. In addition to the expected rate and wave controls, both also have delay and fade settings available. This lets you introduce time-based modulations to your patches. You can also use either LFO as a one-shot envelope by zeroing out the delay and maxing out the fade.
to my delight, LFO1 is also polyphonic, and with the rate set to track mode, you will get different rates per note, one of my favorite synth tricks. Where the modulation starts to falter is in the routing. There are multiple modulation sources that have hardwired, undefeatable routings. LFO1, the polyphonic one, the one I really want to send everywhere, can modulate the low-pass filter frequency and the pitch. That's it. There are two dedicated sliders to assign the depth of each, and that's the extent of your routing options for LFO1. The envelope routings are similarly limited. Envelope 1 can modulate only your filter frequency and pitch, but not to be outdone, Envelope 2 is strictly dedicated to the amp. No other routings are possible. I was baffled when I discovered this and thought surely I was reading the manual wrong, but it is what it is. Any plans of assigning an envelope to wave shape or resonance or pulse width are right out the window. Fortunately, Dreadbox opens things back up with LFO2. After selecting LFO2 in the menu, every slider on the panel becomes a depth control. You simply adjust the fader of the parameter you want to assign modulation to. It's dead simple. Additionally, you have mod wheel, velocity, and aftertouch modulation sources available, the depths of all three assigned using this same method. So, say if I want velocity to affect cutoff by 50% and release by 20%, I just select velocity in the menu, slide the cutoff fader to the halfway mark, and the resonance to 20%, and boom, assigned. It's an ingenious and intuitive way to assign modulation. However, it's not perfect. Modulation can only be applied in positive amounts. So, for example, if you wanted to use aftertouch pressure to close the filter instead of opening it, you're out of luck. Another disappointing limitation. Ultimately, the modulation options of the nymphs are simultaneously intriguing and frustrating. Given the granddaddy synth I think we all associated with the nymphs when it was revealed, I fully expected to see a chorus present. However, Dreadbox mixes things up by going with a reverb. This is not off-brand for Dreadbox, the syrupy reverb-laden depths of the Nyx come to mind, but it's still an interesting choice for this particular synth. The controls for the reverb are shared with the envelopes, accessed by selecting it in the menu. The mix fader brings in the reverb, maxing out at 50-50 wet-dry. The size and decay controls allow you to alter the character and length of the reverb. The reverb is definitely unique. There's a metallic resonance in the upper frequencies that's always there, seemingly regardless of the size and decay settings. You can use the included filter to tame this a bit, but the resonance is ever present. At higher decay settings, it will almost self-oscillate, but never quite run away. There's this ethereal, haunting quality to the sound of it. It's always singing in the background.
As someone who prefers subtlety in their reverbs, this one isn't to my taste, but I'll give it to Dreadbox. It definitely has personality. The Nymphs include several different voice modes, all accessed using the menu section. Poly mode is pretty straightforward, six discrete voices as you'd expect. Unison A provides a stack of six voices, while Unison B stacks only four if you're looking for something a little less dense. And mono mode does as expected, limiting you to a single non-stacked voice. So far, this is all typical stuff, pretty ho-hum. But then we have Try Mode. Try is an interesting setting that adds a lot of versatility. For those of you who don't dig the sound of a single oscillator synth, Try Mode cuts the polyphony to three and stacks two voices. Similarly, Duo Mode stacks three voices. Introduce a little detune and you've got a great sounding multi-oscillator synth, albeit with fewer voices. It's an excellent inclusion. However, Dreadbox just missed a home run here by not giving you any way to further offset the stacked voices. Try mode gives you a bi-timbral voice, but with no way to offset the filter, envelope, or any other settings, we effectively just have a run-of-the-mill detuned oscillator synth voice. It would have been amazing if, when in try or duo mode, the detune control not only offset the oscillators, but also introduced slight offsets in things like filter frequency, LFO rate, and envelope attack and release times. That could have been game changing and something to really set the nymphs apart. It would have sounded epic. Not sure if that's possible through a firmware update, but if so, Dreadbox. Pretty please? Obviously, the interface of the synth is a point of contention. It's clear that this is one of the areas where Dreadbox had to make sacrifices to meet that $600 price point. How big of a deal this is will depend on your skill level and how you intend to use the synth. The layer system isn't too complicated to overcome. Each slider has a default function and a shift function. You can engage shift by holding for a temporary shift or double tapping to keep shift engaged. The labels at the bottom of the sliders represent the default functions and the labels at the top represent the shifted functions. I don't know if it's just me, but this feels backwards and there was a period of adjustment for me to remember that the bottom labels were the default. Regardless, the panel is clearly marked and as long as you always keep in mind whether you have shift mode engaged or not, it's easy to quickly reach for the correct slider. But inevitably, you're going to forget shift is on and change something you didn't mean to and ruin your patch. It's going to happen. It's incredibly frustrating, especially when it's not always immediately apparent why the synth isn't responding as expected, but just know it's part of the experience. As you jump between layers and make changes, you increasingly end up with an interface where the physical positions of the sliders don't match the actual patch settings. This isn't a problem for me because I'm very familiar with synthesis, so I don't need to see the physical position of a slider to make the determination that a patch's filter tracking is set too high, or that the amp envelope release is too fast. I have the experience to just hear the patch and know what adjustment needs to be made and then reach for the appropriate control. But if you're someone who's not intimately familiar with synthesis, who needs to actually see the physical settings of a synth to kind of figure out what's going on, you're going to eventually get confused and lost trying to navigate this thing. It is not for beginners. The menu system is clearly marked and pretty straightforward. I never had any problems changing the settings marked on the panel after a brief reading of the quick start guide. It's very easy to save and load presets. However, there are some phantom settings that aren't marked on the panel or even discussed in the manual. If you need to adjust one of those parameters, God help you if you haven't saved the included menu map placard you'd have to partake in DaVinci Code level antics trying to figure out how to adjust the LFO key sync or fine tune parameters. Fortunately, these hidden parameters are mostly things you're not going to be adjusting all the time, but they're still incredibly annoying and I sometimes had trouble getting them right even with the placard right in front of me. You get no visual feedback from the synth as you adjust them. Finally, all of this is perfectly okay in a chilled out, well-lit studio environment, 
but I can't even imagine trying to fiddle with any of this on stage. Navigating the menu system or jumping between layers in a dark environment would be a recipe for disaster. The synth simply does not lend itself to live performance. There were inevitably going to be comparisons between the Nymphs and the Juno. The six voices, the Roland D interface, the similar architectures. But other than the price and that magical chorus, what made the Juno special was the immediacy and ease of its interface. If you took that away, you'd have a very different synth, certainly not the stuff of legends. If the Nymphs was meant to evoke the Juno, it left out one of the most important parts. Now I want to be clear, the Nymphs sounds really, really good. It's insane that we can get a real, excellent sounding six voice VCO polysynth for 600 bucks in 2022. To put it in perspective, adjusted for inflation, the Juno 60 cost over $5,000 at the time of its release. But regardless of how amazing the price point is, you have to be aware that Dreadbox understandably had to make some sacrifices to meet it, most notably with the interface. One of the key goals for the instrument was affordability, so the Nymphs, by definition, is a synth of compromise. Ultimately, the synth's standout feature is the voice count. Sure, there are other poly analog offerings in the sub thousand price range, but they are almost all capped at four voices. To get six voices before now, you pretty much have to jump into the thousand plus range or settle for digital. The Nymphs changes that. It's not a perfect synthesizer. The limited modulation routing options are frustrating. The reverb is just all right. The interface is limiting, severely so for beginners. But if you don't care about any of that, if all you want is six of the best sounding real VCO analog synth voices you can get for 600 bucks, the Nymphs simply can't be beat. If you'd like to hear more of the Nymphs with no talking, click on the sounds only video link. If you enjoyed this content and want to see more synth and audio production related content in the future, please like and subscribe.